Greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and this is the video teaching series, Our Motives from God's Perspective. This is part three, lesson one, and part three is, uh, the theme of part three is the lifestyle of pure motives. And uh, this is uh, lesson one of the lifestyle of pure motives, our motives from God's perspective, part three. And the, the focus of lesson one is living a life of pure motives. We, uh, in part one, we examined in 10 lessons the biblical reasons why we do what we do and why our motive matters so much to God. In uh, part uh, two of this series, Our Motives from God's Perspective, we dealt with uh, the lifestyle of shame and how that very negatively affects our motives and why it affects our motives, uh, how it affects our motives, and the, dis the need to be delivered and healed from our shame so that we can have pure motives. So again, uh, the purpose of this part three of the series uh, of, the, of the subject, Our Motives from God's Perspective, we're going to be dealing again in the lifestyle of pure motives. To live a life of pure motives, there are things that God needs to do in our lives to bring us to the place of pure motives. There is indeed a life and a lifestyle which is clearly defined by a motive so pure that it guarantees us that we will be recipients of God's promises, promised revival and harvest. But how do, we, how do we attain to such a motive? How do we get there? Paul tells us, and this is going to be the theme of both parts three and four. Uh, part three, we will be dealing with this theme in general. In part four, we will be dealing in very, the specifics of this. But here it is, Galatians chapter 2, beginning with verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So Paul says, I don't frustrate the grace of God because the grace of God's purpose in our lives is to empower us, to energize in us, to activate in us both the desire to please God, which we can't even take credit for for ourselves. We don't have it without the grace of God putting it in us and uh, from a pure motive standpoint and to empower us to then do those things uh, that would please God. So this is, this, this is what the grace of God does. Paul said, I don't frustrate the grace of God, but how do I get to the place that I don't frustrate the grace of God by trying to do the works of God through my own strength, human ability, my own human will, my own human desire, my own human filial love for God instead of his agape love flowing through. How, how do I get there? How does, how does that accomplish in my life? because I allow the Holy Ghost to bring me to the place that I can submit to him and be crucified with Christ. Because if I'm crucified with Christ, I'm living, but it won't be me living. It'll be Christ living in me. And the life that I'm now living in the flesh, I will be living by the faith of the Son of God or the Son of God's faith because he loved me and gave himself for me. The Greek word here, crucify, literally means to impale in company with. Uh, the Complete Biblical Library Dictionary says, the term does not mean simply to crucify, but rather to crucify, crucify along with or among others who are being crucified. And the explanation for how that is possible that Christ was crucified some approximately 2,000 years ago, and yet you and I today can be crucified with him now is, according to Weiss' uh, uh, word studies of the New Testament, uh, the, 
the verb tense of this Greek word translated crucify with speaks of a past completed action with present tense re results. That's Greek grammar. That's not interpretation. That's simply knowing the tense of the verb and defining what that tense of the verb means in however it's used in whatever, whatever place the, 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 the verb is. So again, when I'm crucified with Christ, that is in the Greek verbal tense that speaks of a past completed action that has present tense results. So in Christ, with Christ, by faith, because of my submission to his word and his spirit, he makes it as though I was literally there and crucified with him so that that past completed action has present tense results. This is how your motive and my motives can be made pure by something Jesus did 2,000 years ago that can have absolutely present tense results in my life right now. Crucifixion with Christ purified Paul's motives. In uh, Galatians 2.20 that we just read, Paul defines that exper the experience that transformed his walk with God. This changed him. We're going to be talking about that more in this lesson and later lessons in part three of this series. And we've referred to it in the past, but, but in previous lessons in this uh on this subject, parts one and two. But it's really important for you and I to understand this. It's really important that we understand it. It's important that we get the fact that we get it. It's important for us to get it, that uh, it is submitting to him, dying out to our flesh and our will that enables us to have pure motives. This transformation dramatically affected Paul's life, his motives and ministry, and it will dramatically affect ours. Listen to some of his discussions about the way it affected him and has the potential of affecting us. Romans 6 and 6 says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Christ. Our old man is crucified with Christ. Our old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So the law is the word of God, and the law says shall and shall not. And if I've been trying to be righteous by doing the works of the law through my own human ability, my own human will, my own human desires, I am failing. But I can do what pleases God by being crucified with Christ, dying out to my will, facing my inability to do things called poverty of the spirit, according to uh, Matthew 5 and 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall see God. Because I come to the end of myself and I, I realize I cannot do this. Listen, Paul gives us another perspective of this in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. But what things were gained to me? Now, I don't have the time to read all this. I'm encouraging you to do it. But if you read Philippians chapter 3, beginning verse 1 down through verse 6, Paul itemizes his religious pedigree. And his pedigree was very important to him. So he itemized his religious pedigree. And in itemizing his religious pedigree, God brought him to the end of it because the Lord revealed to Paul that all of his religious pedigree could not save him because righteousness cannot come by my performance in keeping the law. Why? Because if I offend in one point of the law, I'm guilty of the whole law. And once I'm guilty, future right actions cannot, by those actions, undo the guilt of the wrong actions. If that was not true, then people would go to jail guilty, and after they've served their crime, they would come out innocent. But they do not. No place in this world can a murderer cease to be a murderer because he goes to jail and serves 50 years or 10 years or five years. 
It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter how long they're in jail. They're not in jail to become innocent. So there's no amount of good deeds that you and I could do to undo our bad deeds. And when I'm trying to do good deeds to pay for my bad deeds, wrong motive. It doesn't work. It never worked because the law is weak through the flesh. The law is true. The law is good. The law of the Lord is right. But our flesh can't keep the law. So God had a new and better way, a new and living way, because the law, the logos, became flesh, dwelt among us, and the flesh took our sins past, present, and future, and died on the cross to pay the penalty in our place for our sins, that we might be given, 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, his righteousness. So that's the, the, the most miraculous exchange you can imagine, him taking our guilt and us getting his innocence because the root definition of the word righteous is innocent. So I cannot be made innocent or righteous by doing good after I've done wrong, because if I offend in one point of the law, I'm guilty of the whole law. I've said this a lot of times. If I get out on this highway out in front of the church, and it's a 50 mile an hour speed limit, if I get pulled over doing 60, 65, I'll get a ticket. If I get pulled over doing 80 or above, I very likely am going to get arrested. And I can protest and say, officer, why are you taking me to jail? I've never killed anybody. I've ne I don't steal. I treat my wife and my kids good, and, 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 and I, I've never robbed a bank. I can get, I, you know, I've never broken the law. Uh, uh, I've never used drugs. Never, uh, I've never abused that. I can give him all the things that I don't do, and he'll look at me like I'm crazy and say, sir, I'm not taking you to jail because of all the things you haven't done. Take you to jail because of the things you did do. There are good people in jail. There are good people in jail. Because in a moment's time, they made a wrong decision that was illegal. If you're texting and driving and you cause an accident doing that and it kills somebody, you may be the best person there is, but you're momentary lapse in judgment T took somebody else's life and all the good you are and done is it doesn't give that person's life back so paul came to the revelation that everything that had been gained to him gained to him because religion's purpose is always for the person that is religious to gain but gain what gain approval Gain acceptance. Win love. You can't win love that's being given to you as a gift. You can't win love when the person giving the love has offered that gift by their choice. You can't give, you can't win love that's being given freely, offered to you without requirement of, of being worthy. And I've said it before, say it again. I'm sure I'll say it many more times. We have to receive the love of God just like we are. Now, the love of, he loves us too much to leave us like we are, but I don't get right to get God. I get, right, I get God to get right. I don't do right things to become righteous. I receive the righteousness of God as a gift by faith so that the righteousness of God in me will empower me to do right things. That's not semantics, friend. It's the whole difference between religion and true biblical apostolic Christianity. And the transition between the two is called being crucified with Christ. Because even after I get saved, the Flesh wants to continue to try to earn something that it already received as a gift. So there has to be a process of dying out to me to get to these pure motives. So Paul said it. What things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. 
I can't win the Lord through gain. I have to win the Lord through loss. I have to lose my will. I have to lose what's important to me. I have to lose my right to run my own life. I have to die. And then I have to lose my will, my self-will. And I have to die. And then I get his will. And I get his desires. I go from life to abundant life. You'll hear that again. In salvation, I got life. I was dead. I was dead in trespasses and sins, Ephesians chapter 2. I was dead in trespasses and sins. So when I got saved, I got life. But that life made me feel better about myself. And so self doesn't see anything wrong with doing good through its own strength, for its own glory. But then when I die out to that through being crucified with Christ, now I get abundant life because it's not me living anymore. It's Christ living in me. And that is so much better than the other way. Because there's frustration in this first part of our spiritual existence. And frustration produces weariness. And weariness causes people to give up and quit. But in this abundant life, there's peace. There's joy. There's no frustration because there's no pressure because I don't have to perform. I just have to yield to God and let him do whatever is he wants to do through us. So that's the first step. That's the first step in being crucified is I have to, I have to deal with my past. And being crucified with Christ, I have to let my past go, which I talked about in depth in part two, giving up the, the things I have shame over, both the good and the bad of my past I have to give up. What was gain to me? I have to count it lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count, count, present tense, count all things, all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things that do count them but dung that I may win Christ. So the first step in being crucified with Christ is giving up all that stuff, both the things that I have regrets for that I supposedly I'm already forgiven for, but I, I still beat myself up with it. And those things I'm good at that people have bragged on me for, I got to give that all up too. That was all gain to me. But now, what I'm trying to gain now and what I hope to gain in the future, I got to count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. And when you allow, you and I allow the Holy Ghost to give us the revelation of this, we won't even consider it loss anymore. Excuse me, but this is Paul terminology. It won't be any more loss to us than having a bowel movement. It's a relief. Now, that may be a little bit too direct for you, but you got a problem not with me, but with Paul and the Holy Ghost. He was trying to make it real clear to us that when you die out to to, to self by being crucified with Christ by the power of the Holy Ghost, enabling us to do that. Rather than living in grief over here about all that we, we can't have now and we won't be able to get in the future, when we see what we've gained, abundant life, Christ himself li living in me and being able to live by his faith, I count all that stuff that I thought I wanted and had hoped to have as... Dung. And then he says, uh, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, is produced by doing good, but which is of the law, but that which is through faith, uh, the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith. Now, whose faith do you want? Your righteousness? I don't if you were able to be good enough to be righteous yourself, you want your righteous righteousness, or you want his righteousness? You want his faith, or your faith, or his faith? So before I'm crucified with Christ, I can live by my faith. But after I'm crucified with Christ, I live by the Son of God's faith, and I'll be going in all of this more in the future. That I may know him. The purpose of all of this is that I may know him and that he may know me. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So I want to know him, first of all, 
in the power of his resurrection. That's salvation. But then I want to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings as being crucified with Christ. The all, the, the, it's not the other way around. I don't get to know him by sufferings, and then I get to know him by the power. No. He uses the power to save me, deliver me, to bring me to him so I can know how great he is, how powerful he is, what he can do for me. But then he uses circumstances, which we'll talk about in a little bit. He uses circumstances that he could change, but doesn't, as he ages to crucify me. Now I have to have trust. In this first life, I have faith. In this second dimension of life in him, it's trust. He's in control. He has a purpose for everything, and I can trust him. Paul said the same things from a different perspective here, and uh, and and I want to read this. It's a little bit of a lengthy reading, but it's uh, what what awesome stuff it is. Second Corinthians chapter four verse seven. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That's a revelation, friend. You and I are not some vessels of gold and of perfection where. All, all eye is drawn to the. We're just old clay pots. Our value is not us. The value of us to God is not us. It's what he puts in us and the fact that the vessel allows him to be himself through us instead of trying to alter that or change that or use that for our benefit. Woe be to the people that have gifts from God that they use them for their own gain. God have mercy on you. That's wrong motive and it's a wrong path to be down. So Paul said, we have this treasure in earth and vessels, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, that the exodus say the power may be of God, not of us. We are troubled on every side, but yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. How is that even possible? Because in this other life, when we go through that, when this first part of our walk with God, if we're troubled, we're distressed. If we're perplexed, we're in despair. If we're persecuted, we feel forsaken by God. If we're cast down, we feel like he's destroying us or he's letting us be destroyed. But in this new life, we understand all of that has a purpose. And what is the purpose? Always bearing, verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of, Lord, of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our, in our mortal flesh. To whom? To the people that he is manifesting himself to through us. So then, Paul said, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. So I submit to death working in me. And I realize the privilege of being trusted to have death working in me, just like death worked in the man Christ Jesus for my benefit. He's now working death in me and through me for the benefit of the life of others. Verse 13, we have the same spirit of now, we having the same spirit of faith according as, according as his as it is written, was spoken by David. I believe that therefore have I spoken. We also believe therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction is but, is but for a moment, which worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. Do I want glory here? No, I want God to be glorified here. Why? Because in eternity, he's going to give me glory when it's not going to destroy me. I want that glory. I want to be a part of that glory. So I'm willing to die here by the grace of God. I'm willing to die here. So that the outward man is perishing day by day here. He's renewing the inward man day by day. And why? Because our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory, 
while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, they're temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So I'm saying this to you, my friend. <laughs> Why, Paul said in Hebrews 11, the reason that Moses was the adopted son of Pharaoh and was in line for some kind of very senior position in Egypt, but he could walk away all from all of that because he esteemed the, the reproach of Christ's greater riches than all the riches of Egypt. And how could he do that? Because he saw the invisible in the spirit. He saw, he had a revelation of the joy that was set before him, which is what follows just a few verses after that. Consider Jesus, the high priest of our inheritance, who, who suffered all these things. He endured the cross. He didn't enjoy the cross. God doesn't ask you and I to enjoy pain. He doesn't ask us to enjoy sorrow. He doesn't enjoy ask us to enjoy necessity. But we are to have peace in those things and trust him in those things, that they're work, working a far greater thing in our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 31, which is a verse you'll hear again another few times. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ our Lord. I die daily. I, I rejoice in God, but your rejoicing in me is, I, I can't, I can't uh, associate with that because I've got to be, I'm dying daily. So Paul, and I'm going to read quickly, I want to read the full declaration of Paul's freedom from uh, his past life. Just reading uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Freed from sin. I believe it was Peter that said it this way. He that suffers in the flesh has ceased from sin. We'll talk about that one at another time. But the only way for us to be truly free from the influence of sin in our lives is to be dead to sin through the means of experiencing crucifixion with Christ. There were two men crucified with him. One, were, one was benefited, one was not. Because just the act of suffering for your religion, suffering for your faith, does not benefit whatsoever. I have to be crucified with Christ for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the kingdom of God, because I'm surrendered to and submitted to him and him being glorified. We cannot overcome sin or our sinful nature by our effort. We can only do that by dying both to be, by dying out with Christ in, in this situation, we must die to both sin and our sinful nature to be free. In Jesus' name, God bless you. I pray that the grace of God would come upon you. The spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him would enlighten your understanding that you might see this for yourself from him. And that by that understanding and by that wisdom and by that revelation, the Lord would use that to empower you to, both, to desire to be crucified with him and then to be able by his spirit to be crucified with him that you might be free and live a life of pure motives. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.